Welcome to a well-designed business with your host, Luan Nigara. Luan has a lifetime of experience building a multi-million dollar business with her husband and cousin, and she knows the challenges you face in your interior design business. Luan brings you real-life answers to your most pressing problems, as well as practical strategies to explode your interior design business. So, let's get to the business of interior design. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. Today, Catherine Earnhardt is with me. She is the principal of Mason Lane Interior Design in New York City. Catherine comes to interior design through her background in art. She has a BA in art history and economics from William College, and she also has an MA in art business from Sotheby's Institute. Catherine has worked in MoMA's management office, where she learned what drives a world-class museum. And later, she worked in the entrepreneurial hub of Christie's, leading business development in New York, London, and Singapore. Catherine also spent time leading business development at Ger Johns, which is a global advisory and appraisal firm that appraises art as well as high-end design, jewelry, and wine. She's well-versed in art history, the art market, business, and market dynamics. And because of this, Catherine has launched a sort of division, if you will, of Mason Lane called Mason Lane Partners, where she shares her expertise with other interior designers like you who are interested in learning how to incorporate advising, selecting, and framing art for your clients and your projects. So now before we meet Catherine, I just wanted to ask you, are you one of the people that has not gone over to mydomastudio.com slash a well-designed business yet? You need to go over there and see how My Doma Studio can help you manage your interior design projects. Wouldn't it be great if you had one place to organize all of the information, specifications, and communications for every project all in one place? Each individual for each client, but all the information in one place. Well, My Doma Studio is the answer. Head over to mydomastudio.com slash a well-designed business to see how they can help you get started. Okay, now let's go meet Catherine Earnhardt. Hey, Catherine, thanks so much for joining me on a well-designed business today. Hi, Luann. So Catherine reached out to me. She has a pretty interesting business on her hands here. And I thought I agreed with her that I thought it was a great topic to share with everybody. And it reminds me a little bit about my other business, Window Works. So Catherine, as I explained in the introduction, she's a boutique art advisory firm. And she does work directly with her own clients. But she's also developed this ML Partners, where she is now helping and assisting interior designers in selecting the art for their clients and their projects. And the more I learned about your business, Catherine, the more I realized how ex- really, truly similar it is to what we do at Window Works for interior designers. So, and I think it's interesting because art like window treatments is, is complicated and intimidating, right? Totally. Yes. <laughs> and it finished, they both of them finish a space. That's too. a great point. Great point. <laughs> it's funny because I often have said over the years, you can put every single thing in the room, the furniture, the lighting, the accessories. And if the window treatments aren't there, it's sort of like, well, when are you going to finish up the room? And you know, the art is the same way. You're, you're it's exactly exact right. exact same thing. Yes. And it's the la- it's, it can be one of the last things that people <laughs> think about too. And when they're out of money, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> That's also been my experience. It's like, this is all so gorgeous. How much are window treatments there? How much? <laughs> we didn't leave that much budget for window treatments. Totally. <laughs> Although I will say when we got our house, the, the, we had very little money and we put our window treatments on first and we had no furniture, but we had curtains. Good so. for you. I like you already. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So let's walk through it a little bit. What you have found, you shared with me is that in your dealings. Now, first of all, let me just say you, what's funny is when you explained to me, I said to you, how did you come to this? Did you test the theory? Did you find that you had a lot of colleagues asking you? And you said something to me that I thought was interesting. and I'd love to just divert for a second. You said, well, I host an interior design forum in my home every month, and I learned through that that this was a pain point for interior designers. So first, let's tell tell us a little bit about that interior design forum. That sounds interesting. Oh, sure. Well, I have a lot of contacts in the interior design world because they often refer me 
to help their clients get art. And so I realized that there were very limited opportunities for this sort of group of one man, one women businesses mm-hmm. in the creative industry to get together and network. And so I decided to start hosting a forum in my living room and I've casually called it in the Maison since <laughs> the company cute. name is Mason Lane. And we always have a guest speaker that caters the the conversation to something of interest to us. So next month we're having someone come and speak about Instagram for businesses wow. like ours. And we've had branding experts come and other people who are um, helping out with word of mouth marketing and what else did we have? Establishing uh, better resources in your industry or outsourcing or building a company, hiring your first employee. We had a business success coach come and talk about monetizing your creative vision. So it's been a great opportunity. One, because I'm interested in that stuff (laughs) and I learn a lot two, because the dialogue makes it more worthwhile. And three, because we all network with each other and then, um, feel more comfortable referring each other, to jobs. So it's been a, it's been a, a useful experience. That's exciting. I mean, you, you really, it, it, it's, it's crazy, Catherine, how alike we are, because this is exactly what our lunch and learns are at window works every month. Oh, fun! <laughs> so it's pretty funny. I don't know that I would have the energy to pony up and have everybody in my house every month. It's so much easier <laughs> at the showroom because I can just ask my people, can we have the showroom ready for Monday? And then I walk in and it's magically ready. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yes, it is so much fun. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. Now, you're in the New York City area, aren't you? Correct. Yeah, okay. I'm based in Brooklyn. Okay. Very, 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 um, I don't know, like go get them of, on your part. Thank <laughs> because, you. Because, I mean, you could just wait around for the different various topics that will be of use to you to show up on the ASID calendar. But this way, you're going around and finding the things that are of value to you and that are missing in your business and sharing them. And, and we should share p- people and resources here after the show. I completely <laughs> agree. And it's also also a great opportunity for that for the speaker to network with right. some of the the guests I mean it ends up being about 10 guests each time mm-hmm. and uh, some of them have hired the speaker to sure. do work for them there's zero pressure but it ends up being really relevant to everyone's business right that's exactly right I love it what a great idea well, good for Thanks. you I mean because you don't you know you're not busy enough running a business and everything else that you do that too so it was in my <laughs> spare time and honestly the reason why it's in my home is because when I started it I was super pregnant and I just didn't feel like moving <laughs> so <laughs> I just, come to me I just had everyone come to me <laughs> that's great that's great Okay, so that sort of sets the stage then. So you have this um, boutique art advisory firm. You're doing this on your for yourself, you're for your clients, and you're interacting with your colleagues, and you're finding out that art is hard for them, and it's hard for them to suggest and to source and to decide on and to really – educate their own clients on this because it is very complicated. And I, I have, you know, empathy for that because it, it's the truth. It's, I, 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 I often have said, the people who know me really well know this about me, and you guys have heard it on the podcast often enough, that I don't have always that little gene that you guys have to, f- to recognize something that is more special than where it's presented. So I always use this analogy because it, everybody understands it. It's, we all know that it's completely possible to walk into a home goods and find that accessory that placed in the middle of a beautifully appointed room. You'd be hard pressed for anybody to identify that as a $20 accessory, right? You guys call it high and low, right? Well, here's my thing. I, and I'm not a numb nuts when it comes to design. I have a, a few talents. And I have a, you know, a few times around the block, but I will openly say that that is a particular struggle for me. If I see something in that environment, you know, we all know what it is, like 19,000 things shoved on a shelf and maybe something catches my eye and I'll go, oh, that's nice. 
That's pretty. That looks good. And then I look at the price and I'm like, it's $12. Oh, is it ugly? Does it not look good? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So totally. if, if it had $400, I'd be like, it's at home good and at $400. It must be amazing. You know what I mean? Totally. So I think art is the same way. We don't know if, if, if it only costs $300, does that mean it's not beautiful? If it costs $4,000, does it automatically mean it's beautiful? And this is one of the pain points that you help not only your clients with, but you help designers with, right, Catherine? Totally. And everyone has a different budget and a different idea of what affordable means. Mm -hmm. So I try to present them artwork that's within their budget, explain why something is priced the way it is, and also give them the broader skills of being able to go out and get their own art or do whatever they want in the art world, whether it's going to a museum or going to a gallery on a whim or buying something on a whim, like I want to give my clients and designers the ability to, to feel more confident doing that and to not go back and forth and say, well, how does the, if it's expensive, does that mean it's good or bad? Like I want them to be able to evaluate that on their own and, and enjoy the process rather than be intimidated about it. Right. Because I think we've all had the experience where something speaks to us. I mean, even me at Home Goods, I've had that experience. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> you know, where you just like, I don't care what anybody thinks, I love this. So I've had that experience with art as well. But it's when you are in the position as a designer to make a suggestion. And what I just heard in there you describing is every single designer in one project, they might have a budget of say $3,000 for art for three rooms. And that's in the same, the same designer could possibly have another project where it's $50,000 budget for art for three rooms. And so what I hearing is that you're able to help and educate the designer to figure out the best use of the budget in co in comparison to the how it's going to work in the space and what's going to look good in the space. So it's not just more is more and less is less. It's figuring out that sweet spot of using it. Is that, am I correct in hearing that? Yeah, completely. And also I used to work at an appraisal when I was at Ger Johns, which is an appraisal firm. I saw so many objects being priced uh, and so I have a really good sense of what's over overpriced and undervalued, and I'm able to advise designers on that. But basically oh, when a, people... Yeah, that's another aspect of it. One is figuring out the best use of your budget, but the other is not being taken advantage of. Or, yeah. But, okay, okay. Like smartly spending. I mean, I can buy some really low-cost art that's going to look awesome if you put it in the right frame or on the right wall. Uh, or alternatively, you could pay a lot of money, not frame it and put it on a bad wall and it's going to look horrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you really need to figure out not only how to allocate the budget, but how to use it wisely. And when I'm educating clients on buy or designers on buying art, I'm also walking them through the steps of what you look for in quality. So it's not... It's not just the art that captures you that you fall in love with immediately because art can be so much more about um, other aspects beyond just the aesthetics. Mm. And for example, sometimes it's really helpful to ask about what materials were used in making the art. And it, it might be straightforward, like watercolor on paper, or it might be that this artist took a piece of paint oil paint, put it on the canvas, let it dry, put a piece of rubber on top after three days and then put paper and cut it up and did this whole photographic collage on paint thing. And that can also add a lot to how you feel about the work because it goes from being just about whether it's visually interesting to being more about, wow, that's a really crazy process. It must have been labor intensive. And that artist is really creative. How on earth did he think of that? Mm. So it's these are ways to also assess quality and start thinking about whether you've ever heard of a process like that before or if you knew that materials could be used in that way. And that helps add intrigue and I think appreciation for artwork as well. And and that sort of exploration is something that would appeal to a, if a designer had a client that is 
sounds like to me more interested in curating a meaningful collection of art for themselves over their lifetime, whether that means expensive or inexpensive isn't what we're talking about, but that it's meaningful, that each piece has a little story behind it, as opposed to please just finish the living room with some pretty art so the room looks put together. Yeah. And I think the key point that you just said is whether it's expensive or inexpensive, you don't need to pay a lot of money for right. something to be interesting. Right. I mean, there are a ton of emerging art artists out there that are trying to push the envelope and some are very conceptual <laughs> and <laughs> others are um, really doing something compelling. They're dedicated to their practice and they're really making headway. And I think they'll have a place in art history eventually, but right now they're super affordable and I recently saw an article on some art collectors and they have this beautifully designed space and they collect everything that's under $10,000, but they say nothing in our home is purely decorative. So if you can, if you have a client who's saying, I just want pretty art for my room, that's fine. But if you tell her the meaning or the story behind the pretty art, that's going to be so much more meaningful and so much more interesting to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or him. And it sounds like to me that that's a great opportunity, you know, if we just, you know, switch hats a little bit and come off the creative and go to the nuts and bolts of the profit here. If you are working with a client that you see this little spark in there from uh, from other parts of their conversation that they're interested in the backstory on how the furniture's made or they're interested in this, that's an opportunity to say you know, have you thought about your art and have you thought about how you will collect and identify art for yourself over at the time as you grow and, and design your home and we work together? Would you like me to help source things that might have stories and meaning to you beyond just what you're seeing on the paper or on the, on the canvas? And that's like a great segue into maybe being that advisor for somebody and then adding that to your wheelhouse and adding that to your pocketbook, right? Completely. And I really, I mean, every client that comes to me, whether they just want fine art and decorative, and I'm happy to go into the difference at some point if you're interested, mm -hmm. but they still want to know how to spend their money wisely. Yes. I mean, it, let's say they're happy spending a thousand dollars on a piece. It just makes them feel better if you say, this is a thousand dollars and here's why it's interesting. And here's why I think it would look great in your space and why I think it resonates with you personally. Right. So and why there's it's worth always it because you right. Why to, it's yeah. worth it. So right. even if someone isn't interested in really investing in art, which many people are, they still just want to know that their $1,000 is being well spent here rather than there. Right, 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 right. No, I can see that. And, and it's the truth. It, like you're saying, like you're saying, even if somebody has no desire to have this whole other interest of theirs develop over their lifetime, they just need that one piece of art for the living room over the sofa. Mm -hmm. It is... It, it, if you, no matter what you're asking me to spend my money on, whether it's a piece of art or a sofa or a lamp... I have to believe that most clients are going to want to understand why the piece of art that you're su suggesting for me, whether it's 300 or 3000, because depending on their, their scope and what they're doing, both could be just a little out of their box, <laughs> but totally. once you, right. But once you get them to, or provide to them the the reason why and and of course it's not just now it's not we're not now just talking about the reason why as far as the meaning and the backstory on the art but you're also helping and teaching designers why the size is right or why the framing is right or why the the context of the of the art is right for a particular place and place and have and have them start to understand and develop these skills for themselves so that they totally. can do it right okay cool yeah I come up with a whole comprehensive plan for designers on where I would recommend art going I definitely don't want art going on every wall in a space you know I think that that can look really cluttered and I want art to complement the design and further the vision and really finish the space so I help people identify what signature walls they need art on where I would advise spending splurging and saving and ultimately the shape and scale 
and the framing, like the logistics behind it matters so much. Mm -hmm. I go into some people's homes and their art is all hung really high and it, they don't even know that it looks so dumb, but yeah. we've all been <laughs> but, in those houses. Believe me, Catherine, totally. <laughs> you're sitting you there and really you're looking it up, low, but it's always hung too high I know. <laughs> or just hung at really different heights. And that's something that's so easy to fix. And just there, I mean, sometimes clients don't even need new art. You just go in and you say, look, let's move this around a little bit and get this reframed and it's going to look so much better. And it's, it's such an interesting, eye-opening experience for clients. I'm thinking way. about the many times over my lifetime I've walked into somebody's house and sat down, and there's like the, all the kids' school pictures all lined up on the wall, but it's like four inches off the ceiling, and you're like, okay, does I know. that not strike you as odd? <laughs> I know, and I'm short, so I mean, I'm used to looking up a little bit, but it's so funny when people have it just oddly <sighs> close to the <laughs> so and just on that note in case anyone's interested in the standard I mean I <laughs> <Yes>. use <laughs> the center of artwork is generally 57 to 60 inches above the ground above the floor and that's a that's a flexible number, but at least that gives you some some sort of, clue. Start here. Some clue. Like start with <laughs> eyeball it, there. it after that. <laughs> totally. Start with it there, and then you can raise or lower depending on the, the fixtures or the architectural lines or <laughs> the couch underneath, whatever you want. But right. st start there. <laughs> <laughs> That's worth the whole show right there. We can we can go <laughs> yes. home now, Catherine. Pro tip. We've saved thousands of thousands of people. <laughs> from badly placed art. <laughs> 100%. Okay. So talk to us. Now, you mentioned to me that you have a, a webinar, a webisode coming up that's not live as the time that we're recording. So I don't know. We don't know if it'll be live by the time the show airs. But Catherine has put together a webisode where she goes through and goes through the different types of problems that you face when you are trying to help your clients with artwork. And so some of those are sourcing, budget, how to buy. So you, what you can do is I'll tell you if you're interested in this is your, your thing and it's your, oh my goodness, I need to know this, then you'll go to her website. Uh, it's masonlane.com. Is that it, right, Catherine? It's masonlaneart.com. Sorry, at masonlaneart.com. You'll sign up to be on her email newsletter so that when it's live, you'll know. Okay. But in the meantime, you said that you would run through some of these tips with us. Give us some of the, the, the best advice from this webisode that you share sure of course and also if you follow me on instagram i'll make it apparent on instagram oh, when i launches. launch the webisode and my Good. handle is mason lane underscore art Great. but for now i mean i started the webisode because people often don't know what an art advisor is and they seem super intrigued um common comment is, oh, but I can't afford you, but I'm not in your league. And they, they have this concept that all I do every day is just hop around looking at art with really wealthy people. And that's not <laughs> the case at all. I mean, sometimes, which is fun, but not at all every day. Mm -hmm. And so I started a webisode to really walk through what it is I do and why I, how I feel it can help people. And I'm not saving lives, but it's, I certainly think that the home is really important and when your home is finished and it's a reflection of you and your character and you feel good about it it has such strong emotional benefits and so I did some webisodes geared towards the general public and one that I'm really excited about geared specifically to designers because I get so many questions from them um, telling me or or questions from them and I hear about challenges that they say how they want to get their space photographed but their client has horrible art and doesn't want to hang it and they don't know what to do and they've pitched 50 different pieces but the client can't make a choice so that's a great question how do you overcome that right so my strategy for that is well it's it's a multifaceted strategy but one I present an edited list of what works so I am not a fan of the slap 50 images in front of the client and let them pick like they're then they're going to want 50 more I mean I would like that's why I surf the internet for clothes or whatever you know like I'm I it's addicting there's so many options I just want to see more but so I 
filter it down for clients and find art that works within their space, taste, and budget. And I research why and present a paragraph in layman's terms. Like I'm not this esoteric speaking art historian. I mean, I studied art history, but I, I speak in layman's terms. And I present them a paragraph about why it's interesting. And then I meet them in person to go through this presentation. Let's say it's four pieces of art per space. And we go one by one and I have my iPad and I can zoom in and talk through why it's interesting. And that does a few things. First of all, it helps the client focus on just those four. It doesn't overwhelm the client. Second of all, it helps the client understand your value and how much work you spend doing this. Mm. Like it, there is research involved and there's something mental about when someone knows that you spent time on something, they're more apt to pay attention and to provide feedback mm. rather than if you're just emailing a hundred image images. Good point. Uh, um, and then from there, and, and, and those, the paragraph underneath each really helps them grasp why the art is interesting beyond the aesthetics. Okay. And when you meet in person also, you can bring your measuring tape and you can show people how big something would look on the wall because they, even if you say it's 30 by 40 inches or whatever, they're not, it's so helpful to say, this is going to look big on your wall or it'll be small and delicate or whatever your description is, you can help them visualize it. Um, and then from there, we pick out a few pieces. I either do one subsequent presentation based on their feedback, or usually they like a few of the options and we go see them in person and I schedule a gallery visit or artist studio visit and we go see it in person, talk about how it looks and lighting is really important. Like lighting, any designer will know that lighting in a showroom can be really different from lighting in your home. So you need to take that into account. And then, uh, talk about framing and presentation and sometimes even a little bit of room styling will help the piece look at home. You know, it's the worst is when, I mean, it's not the worst, but when you get a new piece of art and it looks so cool on the wall and then the rest of the space looks a little less cool. Like sometimes you have to, <laughs> you have to balance it out a little bit, add a flower, add a throw pillow, I don't know, do something just to make it all work together. But that's right. the case with any, like no designer is going to just put a couch in a room and call it a day. Right. You know, there's always some sort of blanket or throw pillow or something <laughs> to make it look at home in the space. Right, 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 right. So, so what do you do then? Are you mostly sourcing from live visits to galleries? And is that what you suggest that designers to do? And I would, I'm, and I'm just going to say, I, that's, I think where, you know, people start to shudder. Then it's like, Oh, I don't know what I would look for if I went into a gallery. And then we get back to that whole, well, just because it has $4,000 on it doesn't mean it's $4,000. And if I going into a gallery, does that mean that everything's going to be expensive? So totally. I like the idea of presenting the edited list, but I feel like we missed the step on how do they learn how to and where to find and source sure. that list. <laughs> right. Like where does the list come from? Right. So I draw my list. I mean, I'm looking at galleries, and artist studios and auction houses all the time. And I also go to art fairs, which uh, an art fair is basically a trade show for art. It's a bunch of galleries together. It's a trade show. Okay. Um, but it's a super efficient way to see art. Very overwhelming, but they serve champagne and it's definitely <laughs> doable. Um, see, for me, that's where it goes all into the out of context. I don't know if I can, I would be able to spot the values. You see what I'm saying? Like that's right. where you, somebody like yourself would be very helpful for me. Right. So I'm sourcing from all these different places and I, I heard, I think that the best places for designers to source art are really galleries because when you're buying online, there are a few online shops that are certainly affordable, but it's very difficult to tell what it will look like in person. It's kind of like sourcing a rug online, which I've made that mistake many times. It's really tough to tell the difference between overstock.com. I mean, I'm sure designers are laughing at me as I say this, but <laughs> sometimes it looks fine on overstock.com and you get it and it's disgusting right. so <laughs> right 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 so um buying online yes you can find some 
lower price stuff and good resources are Uprise Art and Art Star. Those are two of my favorites. These are Saatchi, online resources? Those saying? are online resources. Saatchi Art is another great one and you can filter results, but it's extremely, it's risky in that you don't really know what you're going to get. And sometimes the Saatchi Art stuff is literally going to come to you rolled up and you need to have it, um, have a support belt. So, and have it stretched. So, but it's important to have these resources because, you know, I, I mean, I've had designers on the podcast express that they're not close enough to a design center. Like we have the D&D right here, Catherine and others, right. you know, but it, could you, I mean, there's, there's probably tens of thousands of designers listening, going awesome galleries, get, you know, you know, trade shows. I'm, I don't have that out here in the middle of Oklahoma or I don't have right. that here. So, so it is, you know, I, I, Obviously, if you're in a metro area, you're going to have that opportunity to go to the art district from the at the bigger cities. But it is important that there are places that you could go if you are in a more rural area, right? Completely. That's such a good point. Uh, and the the websites that I mentioned have a good rotating inventory, so mm-hmm. that's certainly a good starting point another great online resource is artsy and that's a compilation of a ton of different galleries but it's 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 kind of built like pandora radio whereas if you like something it suggests other things that you might like Mm. so that can be helpful and while it's coming from galleries it at least gives you a sense of um what you like and what you're gravitating towards and price point. Okay. Okay. And of course, one of the things that you offer in your ML um, partners program is you, you assist designers with this and, and you do E uh, on art services and consulting with your own clients. And so designers who are listening, if they really don't have any resources for in-person browsing and shopping for art, if they are looking for art online for their clients, then they can hire you as a consultant to bounce it back and say, I'm thinking this, but I haven't seen it. Are you familiar with this quality? Am I correct? Is that part of the services that you offer? Exactly. That's kind of the point. I should have Mm -hmm. thought of that when I spoke last time, but (laughs) that's sort of the point with ML. I call it MLP, which stands for Mason Lane Partners, is that I'm in the biggest art center in the world, arguably, in New York. Mm -hmm. And I also spend a lot of time going to art fairs in Miami and New York and Chicago and everywhere. And not everyone can do that. But if they work with MLP, then they know that they're getting vetted art from all these places. And I can recommend stuff within budget that fits the spec of their space. So it's very different from going to one of the online resources that I mentioned where they're just, there's an inventory. They're still having to figure it out themselves. It's all there, but they have no criteria for figuring it out. Right. Exactly. They have to figure it out themselves and there's an inventory and those sites, some of them do have advisors, but they're, it's like a salesperson at J crew, you know, they're recommending what they have. Right. Whereas I don't have any horse in the race. Like I'm not, I don't have my own inventory. And so I'm pulling good art for whatever good means to you from all around, from all these other sources and saying, here's why I think this is good for your specific project. And here's, here's why. Right. So So, a designer could theoretically consult with you, purchase your uh, services, however you guys all work that out. But at that moment, whether the designer is in New York City or the designer is in, you know, the UK, they can mm -hmm. then email you photographs of the four walls in a client's particular room and then start to bounce back as no different than if you walked into the space with them. This wall should have art. You know, this wall should not have art. This wall should have a piece this big here and then at the end of it you can then ultimately is part of your service where you ultimately might set might do that presentation that you do with your own direct client here's four pieces I would suggest for this room four pieces I would suggest for that room and then let them take that presentation to their client exactly that's pretty cool and I mean it it's also an opportunity for designers to increase their revenue because and finish they're missing that part of the sale because they're afraid or don't know how to do it Totally. And they spend so much money staging. Like I'm actually hired out a lot to stage art. And while that's 
fun. <laughs> I mean, I want designers to be able to finish the space. So staging, so paying thousands of dollars to have art shipped in for a photography session isn't necessary. And you just get art that the client really loves and that kind of completes the designer's vision. Mm -hmm. And of course, I would say you almost probably um, could eventually teach your designers out of needing you right over two or three or five or six you know totally. projects they'd be like oh I kind of get how Catherine does this and I don't need her anymore <laughs> yeah I mean there's plenty to go around I'm right right there's always somebody about... in the pipeline coming behind yeah them. like I want I mean I love it when my clients come back to me and they say we bought this new piece and they just want to show me that's right. great I right. love that I started their art collection and now they have a passion for it and they're right. off doing it on their own that's, yeah that's, I, I brought it up more from the standpoint of I, I do believe that based on how giving you are I can tell from the conversation how passionate you are and how giving you are and willing to help and teach that if somebody really is sitting there thinking you know I actually am interested in this and I would love to really add this as a line item on my projects and kind of pump up the net profits on my projects by offering this I, I have to say I think that it's almost like almost any other investment that you make into like you say you make an investment in a coach you make an investment in a business coach well you don't necessarily have that business coach for the rest of your life you might have the business coach for a year or two years to get your booty off the ground and get you moving right totally. and so that I feel like a, a, somebody who is interested and uh, motivated to really add this to their mix of products and services might look at like it might take me a year or two years of really working with somebody like Catherine and then through all the interaction you're going to develop your own you know you're going to have learned it how to do it in the process I think it's great exactly nice. and I and whenever I present art to clients I include like I said information about why it's interesting and how I would pitch it to clients and then general um, tips on how I sell art some of the things I was going through before give the client this edited list meet in person walk them through the sizing on the wall um so I, I am happy to provide all of that guidance to people because I think it is different from pitching a functional piece of fur furniture. Mm -hmm. And clients often have trouble with the price for art because it's generally a higher price per square inch or foot or however you want to measure mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. than buying a couch. And it's right. seen as decorative, but it really does serve a function in the home. And like I said before, it has a ton of emotional benefits just having that finished space that you feel good about right 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 and the thing to me is that there's two different things that happen I'm sure that we all are familiar with what we've mostly been discussing where the room is designed it's installed and now we're looking at the blank wall or walls and we're like what are we going to do with these walls but then there's also times when our client starts out with, okay, I'm just going to tell you the only thing for sure that's going in this room is this piece of art that's been handed down for four generations, or I bought it last week and I love it, and figure out how to work the room around that. Right. And so do you also help, I'm sure you help your direct clients, but do you help designers with that dilemma too? Because I've, I've, I got to believe there's times when people just look at a piece of art and think, I don't know how I can incorporate that. Or, and, and also let's oh, back totally. up, right? And let's back up from how about, I've heard both. I've heard that art should complete a room and that it should, you know, work within the space. And I've heard that art is art. It doesn't have to match. It doesn't have to coordinate. It doesn't even have to relate. Where, where are you on that? I am a huge fan of design. And so I want the art to complement the design. Yeah, and by complement, I, I don't mean match right. because that's boring. And if you actually, uh, I talk about this in the webisode, but if you look at art furniture, if, I'm sorry, if you look at furniture ads a lot, sometimes they have a piece of art in it and it's the same color as the right. wall. Like right, that's right, great right. for selling furniture because you don't want anyone paying attention to the art. But in your home, <laughs> that's it's really kind of a wasted opportunity to have something that you're you're going to be interested in for more than a week, you know? Right, right, right. <laughs> but, right. but there's um, a fine line between it not being matchy-matchy and being completely disconnected. Totally. So here's another fun rule that someone taught me is that the more color you introduce, color and form you introduce into a space, the more energy. And the less color and form 
the less energy. So if you think about someone that's wearing an all white outfit, mm -hmm. that's a very calm outfit. But if you think about someone wearing like a big print, floral print on top, and then colorful stripes on bottom, that's a high energy outfit. It's the same for a, a designed space. And I fall somewhere in the middle. I think that the art should have something in common with design, but it should also have some distinguishing colors or forms or textures that's not in the design so that it's completely interesting. You know, you wouldn't do a room in all white linen. You would include different shades of neutrals and different textures if you were going for that color palette. It's the same thing with art. You know, don't introduce primary colors into an all neutral room, but you can do neutrals with some soft blue or something else to, to so that you just notice it on the wall and appreciate it. Okay. Okay. So is it the sort of thing where sometimes we have a room that is really say just two or three colors, right? So it's a quieter space. Let's use your mm -hmm. language. Maybe it's, you know, a, a, a whatever. It's a background color of different, and, and within the pieces in the room, whether you're talking about the paint, the carpet, the furniture, it might be various tones of a color. Maybe you have one other color, essentially, that's a pop color. So this is really sort of a monochromatic room. Then what happens with the art there? Does The art there could be a different pop of color, but it wouldn't be 10 colors is what you're saying. It might just be one or two colors too, but, in, but they could be different colors. Well, that's a good question. I do look at art. I do look at color as well as form and subject matter mm -hmm. as well. So you don't necessarily need to introduce new colors, but I would introduce either a new color or a new form or a new subject okay. matter in that way. Like, let's say it's a ocean side room and it's all white. Mm -hmm. Then I wouldn't just do a white linen canvas. I would do maybe have something in common with the outside and do like a pale blue or let me think about this a little bit more. maybe sand and like this like a beiges and greens and blues are all the outdoor colors that you would bring yeah, in like even bring though they're not some right. of that in okay or if there are a lot of straight lines in the room if there are a lot of angles then maybe soften it up with a circular form in the mm -hmm. art okay. i also like to look a lot at light fixtures in art because they tend to be hung close to each other mm, good point right so if there's a really airy beautiful chandelier i try and get art that looks very airy and again doesn't match it but there it has some of the same feel whether right. it or if it's a really dark black that's on trend light fixture um sort of that matte black then i try and look for black lines in the art in some way so that there's a relationship very good. I like it. Very good. Very good. Now, the other thing, we you said it way back in the beginning, and I didn't pull it out of you then, but I'll go there now. Mm -hmm. One of the other really important things, and I learned this on the interview I did with Paul Thomas and Daniel Boschman. I don't know. Do you actually even know Chelsea Frames? You're right here in the area. Oh, yeah, of course. Yes, mm -hmm. right? So he was, Daniel and was on the show, and Paul was on the show, and what I thought was significant, there was a lot of things that Daniel taught us about custom framing and the way it can, the wrong frame can really, a beautiful piece of art can be just totally in the wrong hands, basically, with the wrong frame. Um, oh gosh, and then yeah. a mediocre piece of art can really be enhanced and highlighted with the, with the proper framing. But the thing that I felt was significant was there was a moment in that conversation where Paul felt that a particular piece of art that he did was made better by the frame that Daniel had selected. And I yes. just thought that was so significant for somebody. I mean, and if anybody listening hasn't heard that episode and does isn't familiar with Paul Thomas's artwork, I mean, his art is unbelievable. I mean, it's just so gorgeous. And I'm thinking, wait, you created that from your brain and you <laughs> thought that a frame made it better. <laughs> right. So, and you do, so I bring that up because of course, you know, anybody in the area can go to Chelsea Frames, but also you do that service as well, Catherine, right? Where you help designers select the right frames for their projects and so forth. Absolutely. Right. And I, totally support that a frame can make or break a piece of art and something you touched on earlier is when someone has this really 
um, different piece of art that that's really not the look that a designer is going for. Sometimes a reframe really solves that problem. And changing the matting, sometimes changing the glass. Sometimes the glass is old. Glass technology has changed so much, and mm. there are so many good. I mean, museum glass is has the best. Uh, well, I guess it's the the least it's, reflective right, quality. It's right, like right, it's, right. it's, <laughs> there's no reflection <laughs> problem with it. And changing the glass can make a difference. Changing the matting and the frame shape um, can make a world of difference. And it has certainly, in my experience, improved the look of many pieces of art or made it worse if you do a bad job. But, you know, <laughs> I steer away from that and try and always um, make it so that the frame is now making the artwork work within the space. And I had one incident where an, a wall was painted one color, so let's say it's simply white and Benjamin Moore color, and the artwork canvas, it was a piece of art from the 60s, and it was actually a little yellowish white. And when you put the canvas, when you put the painting, which was a high value painting that these clients were so excited to own, when you put it on their wall, what you noticed was the yellow in the canvas and it wasn't ideal. Of all things, right, is what you're saying, right? It's got a beautiful it frame. Was, we have a beautiful piece, piece of art and we're all noticing this linen canvas. Totally. Matting, it right? was a fail. And so <laughs> we brought it to get framed and we picked this beautiful maple wood sort of whitewashed frame and it really made the transition of the whites absolutely beautiful. Like oh, then it looked like a really good quality. It was a good quality, but it it shined and it mm -hmm. looked like the high quality piece that it was from the sixties. You know, you knew that it was, it was from the 20th century, but it just worked so well with the white. Right. So that's an example of how framing can actually help something work within the space. And certainly I help clients with that all the time. That's nice. And, and the other thing that I noticed that you talk a lot about on your website is uh, gallery walls. So mm -hmm. when yes. you talk about gallery walls, of course, it could be any content. Somebody could have a collection of maps or somebody could have their, you know, 90,000 grandchildren and every ancestor they've ever had. Right. <laughs> or it could be right. botanicals or whatever the heck it is. Totally. But gallery walls are a particular challenge because it isn't just a matter of just slapping everything up there. Tell us a little bit. Give some tips to designers that have an opportunity. Maybe they're working with a client right now that has a series or several things that they'd like for them to put together in a presentation. Right. Gallery walls are a big fan favorite. People, probably because I work with a lot of young families and they love putting their uh, pictures of their family around their home or they've collected a few small pieces of art and they're ready to buy something of a little bit higher quality. So we take their sort of lower quality art and put it together <laughs> in a great gallery wall. But gallery walls get a lot of Internet, internet real estate on the DIY front, like how to do this at home. I am not a huge fan of that theory, and I don't care if people hire me or someone else to do it. I just think doing your own gallery wall, it won't look like it does on Pinterest. <laughs> and that's because it's it, it takes a lot of planning, and I recommend using a design software like Icovia to really plan it out and then get a proper art installer to poke the holes in your wall because it's a ton of measuring. It's a yes. ton of math. And even the, the, the amount of space between the frame and the wall, if that's different on each piece, it looks bad. Right. So in order to get it professional looking, polished, and to stay straight, to stay level all the time, <laughs> you really need a professional. And it's, it can... I mean, You're hitting work, all the pain points on gallery totally, walls. Like, <laughs> totally. That's so right. annoying to me when they all move. But there are little <laughs> things called bumpers that you can get on Amazon, rubber bumpers, <laughs> and put up behind each frame and make it all level. And an art handler is skilled at looking at the hardware behind each frame. And it's never... Even if you get 10 frames from Restoration Hardware, the the oh, hardware all different. behind it is yes. not going to be in the exact same spot. On oh, my goodness. Frame. You just hit it on the head. I, I can't tell you the number <laughs> of times over the years my husband and I were those people on Saturday afternoon arguing at each other. And oh, be my like, God. I want to kill him, too. Oh, my God. Because I'll be like, 
you know, did you measure? Because, of course, we might be doing a series of three or so. Yes, it's 17 inches down. And then, you know, this. Yes, but the, the one on the other one might be 17 and a quarter. It's not. How do you know? Did you measure? I measure. I don't think you measured. It's did you so measure? It's so annoying. <laughs> and, and, and the most annoying part of all of it that I'm sure you've come across is that New York isn't level. Like, <laughs> houses aren't level. Walls aren't level. <laughs> so sometimes maybe it, it's not level, but it's all not level. So it looks right, right. because you live on a right. hill and New York right. is made on tunnel. Like, it's all just, you have to do it. <laughs> and I'll tell you what the other thing is, it's not, even, <laughs> it's not even bad enough that when you get two pictures that the hardware hasn't been put on put on, on the same on the both. But how about the picture where the, 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 the hardware on the one side of the picture is at like 16 and three quarters and the other on the other side of the okay. same picture is 17. We it's have a so piece of great. art that is hanging in our shore house and every single time I walk in the front door, I go, it's crooked. I'm getting you some bumpers. <laughs> and, They're great. And every time, then he looks at me and he goes, <sighs> And then he goes over <laughs> and he nudges it down to straight. And then next day we walk in, I go, it's great. Right. Because the earth moves. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm getting you some bumpers. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I mean, it's almost like a little knowledge is a dangerous thing in that regard. When you go to hang your own stuff. I Look, as little bit as I know of this stuff, I have, I can think of a, of a customer that I had a billion years ago. And I did a lot of window treatments for her, this and that. And she was one of these people that just had, I mean, it was like, pick a spot for the art and she had to pick the wrong spot. It was just, a, I mean, a little bit that I knew, I knew that it was all <laughs> wrong. And of course, it's not what I'm there for. Um, she didn't hire me to do that. So I'm keeping my mouth shut. And finally, we get all the window treatments done and everything. And she looks at me and she says, it's all so beautiful. But what's wrong? It still yeah. doesn't seem right. And I'm like, mm, do I tell her now? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, and you know, and I, and, and, and the simple things like say you had a wall that should have say a 24 by 30 inch piece of art and another wall that should have a, you know, a 45 by a 60. She literally had them reversed. I mean, the simplest things, mm -hmm. like I just wanted to yeah. go, are you not seeing what I'm seeing? And so gently I brought up the conversation and I said, well, you know, I really think that maybe might do you some good. Well, long story long, could I pay you to redo my art? So I went over there one day, literally took every single piece of art she had in her living room and dining room, put it on the floor, and then went about just rehanging it all in the best spots that it could be. And my husband's like, you're doing what on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, she's a nice lady. She doesn't have anybody to help her. Of course, that was way before now. This was when we were building the business and you do lots of things to build totally. the business. <laughs> but I'm sure it looked so much better. It did. It's like, like I said, even the, 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 what, well, I don't know anything, but I, I know proportion and I know scale and that's yeah. what would happen. She just lit. It was like, I'm telling you here, should this or this go in this wall? There's one answer. She picked the opposite one every time. Oh God. So. <laughs> and one helpful tip on that note is to look at the shape of the wall. So if you think about a wall, subtract things on it. Like if right. there are lighting fixtures, say there are sconces or something, don't look at the sconces. Don't look at the couch underneath. Just look at the available wall space right. and assess whether it's a rectangle, a vertical rectangle, a horizontal rectangle, a square. And when you get art, that matches the shape of the available wall space, it's going to look better. Right. Good point. That's a great tip. You're right, because your space left over, even though maybe it's a rectangle, horizontal rectangle over your mantle, but if you've put something on the right side, now it might be a square that's left over. Then it's over. a square. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. And some, I mean, again, it's not a hard rule, but it's a guideline to use. And I, I like to get art that fits the space well, so I'm an advocate of big art, but you always need some sort of margin between the art and the wall or the couch or the sconce, whatever it is. And I always use eight inches as a, as a guideline. It should be at least eight inches because it needs some breathing room. And when the, those proportions are off, you're making your room look small or off, as you described before, and it just doesn't have the comfortable wow factor that you want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, it occurs to me that probably 80 
five percent of the designers listening are like of course we know that i know how to do that but you know what there might be somebody that there's just a little particular bit of dna that's missing in their repertoire and they're not that great at art (laughs) or how to decide where it goes and um and of course i that's just for spatial and and that stuff i'm making an assumption that 85 percent of designers can handle the spatial part of it but the bigger message is that this is a profitable, you know, product line that you can add. I tell people, all the designers all the time, that the same is, is true for window treatments. Don't shy away. Just find somebody who has your back on it because totally. it, is, it's, yeah. it is complicated and it is costly. The mistakes are costly if you make them, but it's a big ticket item if you can add it to your repertoire as opposed to sending them off to someone else to do it. And as long as you have somebody working with you that has your back the way Catherine would have your back in this regard, then it's a great way to add a profit builder to your interior design firm. I like it. Yeah. And they're, I mean, looking, keeping up with the art world is a full-time job. Like I, it's my full-time job and it takes a lot of time to go to art fairs, to build relationships with galleries, to develop the visual eye, to know what artists are compelling and are, are creating new stuff. And so that's why I'm there to help designers get access to that. You know, you don't want to just pick up a print from Serena and Lily and see it at the next house and the next house. You want, if your client wants something that's unique and that really completes your vision, Mm -hmm. work with someone who is in that world and is, has, is the first to know about new pieces and what galleries are doing and at least points you in the right direction because galleries, I mean, I, I made a store analogy earlier, but galleries have programs just like clothing stores have brands. And when you see something you like in the window, then their inventory inside or in art galleries case in the back and storage, it might, it might pique your interest in the same way. Mm. So it's important to know what is in the back <laughs> galleries showcase one-tenth of what they have in inventory and what they have access to. Interesting. Yeah. So oh, going around, right. Like going around to galleries and hoping to find that, that piece that fits your space, taste and budget can be really arduous. I mean, some people think it's fun, but after a while it gets annoying if you're not fine, if you are doing sort of a blind search. So to be able to work with someone that knows exactly where to go, exactly what's in the back, where to find that piece that's going to, spatially work and appeal to the client can save you a ton of time. Mm. That's 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 a great point right there. You know, because like you said, you have the knowledge, you have the expertise, you have the relationships and you ha- you have an idea of the, just knowing that what's on display isn't all that they have. Who I would not have known that. I would have thought, well, there it all is. <laughs> There's oh, nothing totally. at this gallery keep moving down the street. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and And I have galleries that know me. And when I walk in, they'll say, you're not going to like any of this stuff, but look who else we just Mm. picked up. So it's, I mean, they do different kinds of shows and you just need to know what they're capable of, what their resources are and what artists they're representing, which basically means they're acting as an agent for those artists. Nice. Very nice. Well, I think it's awesome. I think that it's, a, like I said, it's a valuable outlet. It's a valuable product line to add for interior designers, but it is a product line that has a high learning curve. If you do it right, it has a high learning curve, but there's people like Catherine who are out there to help you if you're interested. And it's masonlaneart.com, right, Catherine? Correct. Okay. And um, we're, you have the MLP, which is the Mason Lane Partners line, which is to the trade. You can find all about that on Catherine's website. And also keep an eye out, get on her email mailing list so that you're aware when that webisode, uh, is it a series or a single show that's coming out, Catherine? There are four. It's a series. Okay. There are uh, four or five that we're going to release. I love it. I love it a lot. I mean, because just that little bit right there to sit, if you have an interest in this and have an interest in introducing a little bit more expertise to your design firm by, you know, offering services that encompass art and placing of art and purchasing of art, I'm sure that the very least the web series, the webisode series is going to be helpful. 
Yeah, and they're all about 10 minutes. So. Oh, that's good. That's even better. Small yeah. <laughs> chunks of information. <laughs> it takes hours to film, but 10 minutes edit. That's the truth, right? It's so true. But I have to say, a lot of times, I, something I'm even highly interested in, the first thing I do is look to see how long it is, and I assess right then and there, do I have the headspace for this? <laughs> so that's great. Well, I appreciate your coming on the show, Catherine. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Okay, bye. Okay, bye-bye. So this sounds like a pretty nice service to me. How about you? I would think that no matter how talented you are at interior design, that advising and purchasing art for clients on some level has to be a bit nerve wracking. I don't know, maybe it's me, but I, you know, it's one thing to buy art for yourself. It's, uh, you know, whether if you fall in love with something for yourself personally, whether it's two hundred or $20,000, it's just about your budget, right? And what you can afford. But when you suggest art for a client, and if it's possibly pricey art, I would think you'd want to be well prepared on why a particular piece is in a particular price point. And that's exactly where Catherine comes in. She comes in and she helps you, you know, navigate that process and understand how you can be more skilled in that area. So if you think that this is something that would help you, then head over to masonlaneart.com and then look over to the Mason Lane Partner area. Okay. Now, if you happen to be listening to this in real time, October 2nd, 2017, in two days, I will be at the Kravitz Showroom in Philadelphia. So please come out if you're in the Philly area. I'll probably get there in the afternoon, 1.30, 2 o'clock, whatever it might be. Um, I would love to interview you if you are going to be coming to the showroom. Nothing intense. and You don't have to study up for it. I'm just looking to maybe spend 10 minutes with a couple of you and see what you think about the new showroom and maybe find a particular item from curating kravit.com that you'd like to tell your friends about. We'll be doing Facebook Live from there. So if you are not in the Philadelphia area, please check your Facebook feed. Please go to the Luann Nigara uh, Facebook uh, feed and subscribe so that you know when I go live. And of course, I'll also be broadcasting live from the Kravit feed. So either one, you should be able to find us, okay? And then sometime around 3, 3.30 in that area, I will be interviewing Scott Kravitz, who may or may not have an easy interview. We shall see. I'm probably, I'm going to ask him a little bit more questions than I would ask you guys. So, but either way, it's going to be fun. All right. I want to give you a reminder to visit our website, Windowworks at www.windowworks-nj.com because I have some designer besties as guest bloggers there on my consumer facing site. I have Erin H. Brown and she has been posting the steps to a total home renovation that she's working on in Arizona. There's been two posts up already. Another post will be coming soon. And then Laura Thurman from Thurman Design Studio in Nashville is going to be starting her guest blogging, um, probably right around the time of this recording going up, or if not, it'll be the following week. And Laura is going to take my Window Works consumers all the way through the holiday season, giving them tips on curb appeal, on decorating, on guest room preparation, and all of that stuff. So these can both be found at www.windowworks-nj.com slash blog. So this is not the to the trade blog. This is my consumer facing blog. Okay. All righty. One last thing. I sent out a short five question survey to everyone on my email list last week, if two weeks ago at this record, by the time this goes up, if you could take five or 10 minutes to answer the question, I'd be so grateful. These answers will help me a ton in being able to bring new ideas and features to the show. It's really, really quick. I promise. Believe me, I hate big, long drawn out surveys. I really do. Like, like house.com sends me a survey like every 25 seconds. And if I open it up and if it's more than five questions, I'm like, no, next, over, click, done. Okay, so I get it. I hate it too. So this is five questions, promise. And it'll be very helpful in in me doing, I have so many ideas for this show. It's silly. It's a little silly. But um, this is going to help me get focused and help me, um, you know, make these things happen for you. Okay, so now if you are not on my email list and you'd like to be on the email list, please, you can text this number. Go to your phone and text four. 
four four nine nine nine. Put in the field Design Biz. D E S I G N B I Z. No caps, no spaces. It will take you to one more field where you put your email address in, and then we will get you on our email list. Okay, so. Please, I would be so grateful if you'd fill out this little questionnaire. It'd be really awesome. All righty. That is it for today. Have an excellent day. Thank you for joining me again today for another episode of A Well-Designed Business. This podcast is a production of Window Works in Livingston, New Jersey, your trade resource for custom window treatments and awnings. Learn more about Window Works at www.windowworks-nj.com. All of our music is original music by Room 2 Productions. Please contact us if you want to learn more about original music for your business or your events. 